Hey everyone, it's Mark and I'm back today with another Microsoft Flight Sim Airplane Guide and this time I'm going to be looking at the Black Square Bonanza. I'm going to cover a bunch of stuff including the differences between the fuel injected and turbo normalized versions, how to get it going when it just won't start, how to lean for power versus economy and a whole lot more so make sure that you stick around so that you can get the most from this fantastic airplane. The first decision that you've got to make once you've actually purchased and installed the Bonanza is which version of the airplane that you actually want to fly because you get the choice between three different models. Your first option is very similar to the default Bonanza in terms of external looks except it's going to have all of the analog gauges on the inside along with all of the extra realism that you bought the Black Square mod for. I haven't flown this version very much, mostly because I prefer the look of the other two models that have the tip tanks on them. I just find those tip tanks make the airplane look so much cooler. The big difference between the two models with the tip tanks though is that one is a fuel injected naturally aspirated engine, while the other is a turbo normalized fuel injected engine. The non-turbo version is going to lose power as you climb higher and higher, but in the turbo version, you're going to actually be able to maintain that same level of power that you get at sea level up to a much higher altitude. So for all of those reasons, the rule of thumb that I like to use to decide between which version that I'm going to use is my cruise altitude for my flight. If I'm taking off from above 5,000 feet or I want to cruise higher than 10,000 feet, maybe because I need to get above some weather, I'm going to go with the turbo normalized version and otherwise I'll just go with the fuel injected version. Flying the turbo normalized version is pretty similar to the fuel injected version. There are a couple of little differences that you need to know about and I'm going to cover those as we go through the flight. Fuel injected engines like the Bonanza are sort of notorious for being difficult to start and the modeling the Black Square did definitely reflects that. I did a lot of experimenting with all the different starter procedures that are in the checklist that are provided with the airplane and although they are accurate to the real world I'd say that the normal start procedure only works for me one time out of two. To get started you want to make sure that the throttle, the prop and the mixture are all at the cutoff position and then you can flip the battery alternator and standby alternator all to on. And then what we've got to do is check that the fuel pump is functioning by just turning it on low for a second until you hear that very low level whine that it makes at which point you can just turn it back to off again. Next, you're meant to flip the standby gyro on and off to make sure that the enunciator light turns on right at the top of the instrument panel. And with that done, we're going to get to the tricky part. I'm going to start by bringing all of my controls to full, so the mixture, the prop, and the throttle all to the wall. At that point, I can go back to the fuel pump, turn it on to high for about two or three seconds, and then turn it back off again. That's going to prime the engine by sending in a bunch of fuel into the cylinders, but it's very easy to actually flood the engine, so you have to be careful when you're doing this. I'm going to bring the throttle back now so that it's open by just a smidge, and I'm going to try cranking the engine. In this case, it looks like it caught pretty quickly, so that was pretty good. But if it hadn't, what I would do is then prime the fuel one more time for an extra two or three seconds and try to start it again. If the engine doesn't start after the second priming, what I found works for me is to go to the flooded start procedure that you can find in either the operating manual or even the built-in checklists inside of the sim. And if all of that fails, you can always hit the control E key to auto start the engine and then just try again next time. If it takes you a few tries to get the engine to turn over, it's probable that you're going to run the battery down a fair bit and you might get an enunciator light that will appear right at the top of the instrument panel. The battery only seems to charge when the engine is under load, so don't worry about it too much for now and once you get taxiing with a little bit more power on, it should turn off. The engine simulation in this airplane is really in-depth and you're going to want to lean the mixture a little bit before you start taxiing around just to avoid spark plug fouling and this can happen in both the naturally aspirated and the turbo normalized version. You're going to want to do the same thing, just pull the mixture out by about 25 to 40 percent. I also preloaded my flight plan today from Buffalo up to Toronto into the GPS just to try and keep the video a little bit on the short side. So other than turning a few extra lights on, I'm pretty much ready to taxi. We're going to have a look at everything that we need to know about engine life management in just a second. But before that, I want to remind you to like the video if you haven't already and subscribe as well while you're at it. It's going to do me a big favor and it's going to help other simmers find these tutorials as well. 
Takeoff in this airplane is fairly straightforward. First, you want to make sure that your flaps are set to the approach position. Make sure that your cow flaps are open and you're going to want to bring the mixture to full rich now for both the fuel injected and the turbo versions as long as you're taking off near sea level. If you're doing a high altitude takeoff with the non-turbo version, you're going to want to lean the engine properly before taking off to make sure that you get maximum power from the engine. And I covered how to do that in a previous video, so I won't show you how to do it here and I'll link to it in the show notes. On your takeoff roll, you're going to want to linearly apply power, especially in the turbo version of the airplane, because you need to be careful to avoid over boosting the engine because it could cause some damage to it. Rotation speed is at 74 knots and once you've got a little bit of altitude under you or there's no more runway left in front of you, make sure that you bring your gear up. And once you're at about 110 knots, make sure that you have the flaps up too. There are a lot of factors that can contribute to reduced engine life and failures in this airplane. You can monitor how you're doing at a very high level by going onto the weather radar menu and just going into the topmost option of the menu knob and your engine health is going to be indicated to you right at the middle there. It's indicated as a percent there and as you fly the airplane it's natural that that percentage is going to start dropping and the engine is going to wear out just from normal wear and tear. But on top of that there are a couple of things that you can do that can contribute to the engine life dropping off really quick and those are the ones you have to watch out for. Let's start with the manifold pressure which is controlled by the throttle and for the climb out I'm aiming for around 25 inches so I'm going to bring the power back a little bit right now but the thing is is as I continue to climb the MP is going to drop so I have to keep monitoring it and adding in a little bit more throttle to keep it where I want it. If you're flying the turbo version, the MP is going to stay constant as you climb until you reach something called the critical altitude, which is going to be at around 19,000 feet. For that reason, in the turbo version, you don't need to adjust your throttle on the climb out. You can wait until you level off at your cruise altitude, at which point you're going to want to adjust your mixture to maintain the power or economy profile that you want, which we're going to look at in just a little bit. Next we've got the propeller gauge which at full pitch is going to result in about 2700 RPM and although it'll take a long time to wear out it's best to bring it back to around 2500 RPM as you climb out to your cruise altitude and that'll also make for a slightly more quiet cabin as well. The other four gauges that you need to keep an eye on are the cylinder head temperature, the exhaust gas temperature and the oil temperature and pressure. If any of these get to their upper limits, you're going to see that the engine life is going to start dropping off drastically and you'll have to stop what you're doing and investigate what's going on. It could be due to a failure, which can happen in this airplane, but if it's early on in the engine life, then it's likely something else that's causing it. The most likely culprit is probably that you're pushing the engine beyond its limits. So what I would start with is by leveling off and try reducing power a little bit to see if it helps at all. When something goes wrong, the engine monitor alarm, which is right at the top of the instrument panel, is going to light up to warn you about it. So you really only need to occasionally check those four gauges in case the enunciator panel fails, which can also happen in this airplane. Once you get to your cruise altitude, you're going to want to close the cow flaps, which are there to make sure that the engine gets enough air during takeoff and climb to keep its temperatures down. But if you leave them open once you're at cruise, your engine temps are going to drop off a fair bit, so it's best to close them to maintain the right temperature. Normally, you would want to adjust your mixture every 5,000 feet, so let's look at how to do that with the engine monitor. And there are a ton of features to this thing, but I'm really only going to cover the essentials here. At the top of the gauge, we've got the current horsepower that the engine is developing, and right below that, we have the temperature bars for each of the cylinders of the engine. In the top right, there's a little indicator to say if you're in Celsius or Fahrenheit, and you can toggle between the two of them by pressing both buttons on the bottom at once, which you do in Flight Sim by actually pressing an invisible button that's in the middle of those two buttons. The display below the bar graph shows a bunch of information about the engine and also a couple of other things like the outside air temperature, your fuel consumption, and you can walk through all of that information by pressing the left step button. There's a table in the operating manual that can tell you what each one of the values means and we'll be looking at a few of the most important ones during the flight. Let's start leaning the engine and there's two different ways to do this. 
we can lean rich of peak which is going to give us the most power from the engine at the altitude that we're at or we can go lean of peak which is going to give us the best economy from the engine and extend our range as much as possible I'll lean rich of peak to start and to get going what you need to do is press the lean find mode which is the right hand button and the display is going to say lean r for rich of peak at that point i'm going to start pulling back on the mixture and in just a couple of seconds you'll see there'll be a light that starts flashing on top of one of the cylinders and then the display is going to say leanest I'm going to stop pulling the mixture out at this point and now I've got to actually enrich the engine so push the lever back in a little bit and I'm looking to bring it back to the point where it's going to develop the most horsepower and that's usually going to be somewhere between minus 28 and minus 56 below the peak EGT that we found so really you just have to play with the mixture axis until you find the point where you get your peak horsepower. Once you've found the value that gives you the most horsepower, you're pretty much set for the entirety of your cruise. And if we look at the fuel flow gauge, you can see we're at about 17 gallons per hour. So let's see what happens if we go lean of peak instead to get the best range out of the airplane. There are really only a couple of situations where you'd want to go lean of peak that I can think of anyways. And one is obviously if you're flying a very long flight, but I don't really do that. But you could be in a virtual airline or using some type of career mode where you need to use as little fuel as possible for your flight. And this is going to allow you to do that. I'm going to start by bringing the mixture back to full ridge so that it's like if we had just leveled off at our cruise altitude and we're getting ready to lean the airplane for the first time. And then just like before, I'm going to press the lean fine button. This time though, I need to press the middle button for three seconds so that it switches from lean R to lean L for lean of peak. The next step is going to be exactly like for rich of peak. I'm going to start pulling the mixture out until it gets to the point where one of the cylinders starts flashing and a couple of seconds later I'm going to keep pulling on it and it'll say that I'm at the richest point. Once I find that richest point I have to do the opposite of what I did before so I'm going to keep leaning the engine so I'm going to keep pulling the mixture out and in this case I'm looking for a positive number that's somewhere between 14 and 28 celsius so that I get the best engine power and optimized fuel flow. It seems like the best that I can do is about 204 horsepower with 14 gallons per hour of fuel flow versus when we were rich of peak I had something like 220 horsepower with 17 gallons per hour of consumption. In terms of airspeed though, it only equates out to about a 5 knot difference, so depending on your needs, it could be useful to go one way or the other. Let's wrap up our talk about engine management by looking at the fuel situation. You can see right now that I've got less fuel in my left tank than my right one, and that's because it uses the fuel from one tank at a time, and you're actually meant to swap the tank throughout your flight to keep the fuel usage close to equivalent on both tanks. Doing that's really easy. The switch for it is on the floor next to the pilot's side and right now it's pulling from the left which makes sense because we have less fuel in the left so I'll swap to the right tank. I try and swap the tanks every 15 minutes of flight or so but that's usually because I'm doing relatively short hops. You might want to do it less frequently but just don't forget about it because you could end up in a situation where you'll have a lot more fuel in one tank than the other and it might make it difficult to fly the airplane. Earlier on in the video I mentioned those tip tanks and they can help to extend your range as well when you need it. And there are two switches on the right hand side of the cockpit that you can use to drain the fuel from them into the main tanks. Since I ran the fuel down on the left already I'm going to activate the left tip tank and if we watch the gauge you're going to see it slowly go down and the main left tank is going to go up. You can also see this a little bit more clearly if you open up the weight and balance page but I find this kind of breaks the immersion of flying the airplane so I try and avoid it. The last thing I want to touch on before descent is the cabin and outside air temperature. There are two lights on the left side of the cockpit, a red one and a blue one to indicate if the cabin is either hot or cold and you can see the exact temperature that you're at on the gauge that's on the right where it says cabin temp. If your cabin's cold, you're going to want to turn the vent blower to on and pull the knob that's right below that out just a little bit so that you can increase the amount of heat that's being pushed into the cabin. If your cabin is hot, on the other hand, you can turn the AC on first and set the blower to low or high, depending on how fast you want to bring the temperature down. 
I actually find it a little bit hard to maintain the right temperature all the time and you have to keep an eye on it because unlike the real world you won't feel it when it's getting hot or colder. And on top of that you can also fiddle with the vents themselves on the overhead to try and get to the right temperature. While we're looking at the bottom instrument panel the other thing I want to point out is that we have the pito heat and the prop the ice switches there as well. The Bonanza isn't certified for flying in icing conditions so you should try and avoid it but because icing isn't very well simulated in flight sim at the moment you can probably get away with it anyways. You can see the outside temperature on the engine monitor by pressing the step button until it displays OAT and whenever it dips below 4 celsius you're going to want to turn the pitot heat on and if you get close to freezing or you're flying in clouds that might have icing conditions you're going to want to turn the prop de-ice on too. I'll typically plan for an 800 foot per minute descent rate but you can use something more aggressive like a thousand feet per minute if you really need it. Although don't forget that the Bonanza is not pressurized so you don't want to descend too quickly either. It's best to bring the MP back to 20 inches or less and you can back off the prop to 2300 rpm so that it prevents the plane from speeding up too much as you're descending. With regards to the autopilot, it's pretty basic compared to what you might be used to with a G1000 or other similar Garmin units. The nav and heading modes work how you'd expect them, however there's only one way to climb or descend and that's with vertical speed and it's a little bit finicky to operate it especially if the cabin is shaking around a lot from the wind. The knob that's next to the AP altitude has three click areas which are really close together and it's really easy to accidentally click one or the other. So what I actually like to do is use the button that's at the center of it to switch between the altitude and feet per minute modes and then you can use the up and down keys that are on the full panel at the bottom of the instrument panel to change the altitude or the feet per minute to whatever you need it to be. I'm flying a visual approach today but if you choose the option with either the GNS 750 or the 530 you can also fly instrument procedures with this airplane and as you get closer to landing there are a couple of things that you're going to want to keep in mind to prepare the cabin. You're going to want to swap tanks one last time to the tank that has the most fuel available. This is especially important if you're low on fuel either after a long flight or because of a leak in one of the tanks which can also happen. Clap should go to approach as you're entering the traffic pattern on the downwind leg and then to full once you're on base. Or if you're doing a straight on approach like I am today, I go to approach flaps about 5 miles out and then I'll go to full flaps at about a thousand feet above the airfield. The prop and the mixture should go back to full so that the engine develops as much power as possible. In the case where we need to go around, we're going to need max performance from the engine. If you lower the gear while your AC is still on, you're going to get an annunciator light that's going to tell you that the AC door is extended and that's going to be your cue to turn the AC off to make sure that you get your max performance from the engine in case of a go around and it should turn the annunciator light off as well just a couple seconds later. I fly short final at around 90 knots with my goal being to be at 85 as I go over the threshold and 80 at touchdown. But overall the Bonanza is really stable and you shouldn't have too much difficulty setting it down on the runway center line. It gets bounced around a fair bit more if there's a lot of wind so it's more challenging in those situations to land it but it's still a ton of fun to fly. That's gonna cover it for learning the Bonanza and if you learned something useful during this video please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe as well so you don't miss out on the next one.